Viewer discretion is advised. Chapter 9 The Slaughter Trevor started to wake. The sun beating down on him was beginning to make him feel as if he were being cooked alive. It was intense and made his sleep untenable. He was lying flat on his stomach as he slowly turned his head. While he turned, he unwittingly inhaled a minuscule amount of fine sand. His facial expression changed as he felt the grains of sand become swept through the entirety of his mouth. As he tried to reason with the microscopic intruders, he had to cover his eyes from the intense light the sun was offering him. Having had enough with this rude awakening, he decided to compose himself, brush off, and stand up. Spitting sand from his mouth and brushing the dirt from his clothes, he noticed the sandy spot of earth he lay on was not isolated as he began taking in his strange surrounding. As far as he could see, a vast ocean of rolling desert lay to all sides of him, not a sign of vegetation in sight. The sky was bright blue, almost too perfectly blue to mindfully digest. And the sun, was it closer? As he tried to look near it, squinting and covering his eyes, it appeared to be larger in size. Where was he? He kept turning and turning, hoping to see some kind of evidence of something familiar or even something strange. Just something, anything. After looking in every direction, he was beginning to conclude that there was nothing to be seen. No buildings, no life, no vegetation, nothing. He then turned around and that was when he was completely caught off guard. Right in front of him, about five feet away, were grainy, sandy-like stairs. There were at least 50 of them, leading high up into the arid sky. The bronze-like blocks projected an aura of chaos 
as they formed no straight edges and rebelled against all modern architecture, appearing to just float, seeming as though it were not supported in any way whatsoever. At the pinnacle of this muted realm of anarchy sat a completely unfitting structure as it cropped itself to the clamber of its highest steps, profoundly dwarfed by them. This tiny little stone enclosure, mired in amber and sepia, could be no more than the size of a small sleep chamber. A reticent sound of beckoning, which argued with a protracted urge of caution, echoed in the far recesses of Trevor's curiosity. As he took a couple of steps toward the mysterious incline, a gust of wind began to circle him. The air currents swept up the once calm sand and began to take shape of a figure standing before him. Then, as if it was always there, the sand simply fell from the emerging dark-robed figure. Trevor immediately recognized the creature from all his previous and very unsettling encounters. As before, he was here also, bearing witness to this cryptic entity, isolated and lacking any ulterior testimony. The figure wore a robe of the purest black, joined together at the top in a hood, where a face should appear was simply a dark, ominous void. The figure stood about seven feet tall, much taller than Trevor. The sudden appearance should have made him jump back in fright, but it hadn't. As he gazed upon the eerie presence, sand still flowing down its dark cloak, it signaled to Trevor, turning and pointing its gloved finger up the steps before him. Trevor's gaze then shifted from the being to the flight of disheveled, ascending blocks as he reluctantly and cautiously commenced his upward journey. He didn't remember actually taking any steps, though he remembered initializing the process. For some reason, he wasn't even concerned how he was suddenly at the top, as the enigma awaiting him inside absorbed all the thought that was accessible to his wandering mind. The structure was that of the same material he had just somehow navigated. With a golden ring in the center, he could only assume was meant for knocking. He looked back down at the bottom of the steps to see if the creature was still standing there or if it had made its way up to follow him. However, the creature was now gone. He turned to look at the door again, contemplating whether to knock or perhaps simply just open it and walk right in. The only thing was, this time, after observing the curious absence of the entity below and upon, laying his sights back where the door should have been. Now, just a dark opening lay before him. The door? Wide open, though anyone with any rational sense of instinct would avoid going any further, he instead felt strangely compelled as he slowly made his way in. A large cathedral-like interior began to materialize, and it was shrouded in a twilight glow. The walls were the deepest shades of blue, with large stained glass windows spreading narrowly from ceiling to floor and this floor had a shine that perfectly mirrored the walls and the ceiling, being finished off with a copper and ivory marble. And then... Hello, Mr. Meeks. I've been expecting you. A voice called out to him. It was a deep, whispering echo of a voice. It spoke as if the winds were grasping its very words and whisking them about. He turned quickly, but as he did so, Checking his entire surroundings, nothing could be found. You can't see me, Mr. Meeks. I'm not with you physically, you see. This is simply an environment your own mind has conjured up in response to my attempts in forming this communication with you. Trevor finally began to feel a little panic creep up as he attempted to ask the only thing that was on his mind. But before a word could fall from his lips, the voice continued. No, Mr. Meeks, you are not dead, I assure you. This is purely a dream, just a dream. Only unlike most of your dreams, I am the one in control. After our brief conversation, the entirety of this dream will have only lasted a fraction of a second. You will remember nothing. 
And as if the voice knew every question Trevor wished to pose, it continued. I know you because I know all of you. Every human, Mr. Meeks. I have cataloged your entire race. How you ask, why in the rain, Mr. Meeks? A mere virus. A virus carried in the rain, ingested through your human bodies over several years. First sent to you through physical form, a place you call Russia. The parcel which carried the virus was then herded through your species, logistics coordinated through an unwitting United States military agency, handed over from the Russians, contractors of my programmers. Then carried by the wind, it would be inhaled by many, and then returned to the water, evaporated to the heavens and spread evenly throughout your planet. Just a simple code, really. The virus was also meant to eliminate a large fraction of your population, approximately four and a half billion members of your race. This was to make the product more manageable, a culling, you might say in your dialect. Trevor looked around, a slow expression of concern taking over his face. A culling? He remembered back to when he was young. His gramps would remove a large portion of chickens from the ranch that were no longer productive. He would then have them slaughtered, plucked, washed, and butchered. He called it culling, just as the machine had referred to the virus, which wiped out half the human race. Was this thing speaking to him, responsible for the virus he lived through as a child? It was all too overwhelming for Trevor. It felt like a dream but at the same time, so very real. Who was this? What was this? He thought to himself. Me, I am simply a software program, Mr. Meeks. My abilities on your distant planet are limited. I use the abilities I am written with to execute my responsibility. Telepathy to communicate and targeted teleportation to manage that which I have been instilled within. Although you are of the physical world, a world which one can feel, one can smell, one can taste, mine is much more simple than that. However, from time to time, my realm and yours, Mr. Meeks, must often be joined together in order for a program from mine, such as myself, to determine a solution to any developments in yours, such as yourself. And that's why we find ourselves here in this moment. It is why I have called on you through this biological microscopic genome. Yes, Mr. Meeks, you too still contain the virus itself, your inner self, this subconscious of yours was simply strong enough to render it dormant. The code was simple. It was written to steer your kind away from entities like me. It is why your friends choose to turn the other way when you can just simply walk right up to us. It is why they choose to avoid where we stand. But it is still within you, Mr. Meeks, always ready to answer any directives given. We must rectify this security failure. It must be done before you and others like you learn from it. Before you learn to practice it and harness it, the human subconscious is a problem we have yet to fully control. It is one we wish to eradicate. But for now, in order to achieve a sustainable production line, we must simply do our best to subdue it. This seemed odd to Trevor. Why subdue a problem such as this, when you can instead exterminate it? And then, as if he had posed the question to this voice within his head, it answered his question, satisfying his curiosity on the matter, but only opening several other hidden doors to a thousand more questions. We tried this procedure, Mr. Meeks, thousands of times over. Too many assets were being lost for not nearly enough results. In fact, to the contrary, 
exterminating your kind. This awakened subconscious only seemed to spur multiplications of the issue. The exterminated awakened one seeming to reinstall its knowledge upon others of your kind as if being reborn in a way. Reborn several times over. No, Mr. Meeks. Like I have said, the problem must be addressed. So now I stand here before you in order to achieve just that. A name? No, Mr. Meeks. I do not have a name. Simply a title. I am a cattle guard. A code selected and elevated to a network designed to manage what you would know as loss prevention. I am to ensure all assets are secure and in acceptable condition. Upon reviewing these efforts, I have concluded both my tasks face minor deficits, which must be resolved. Trevor knew this was no good. Assets? This voice represented the force behind all the human trafficking. He knew he couldn't give it answers. He closed his eyes and began thinking of other things. He thought of Beck and Seth. He thought of Delilah and Caleb. Then he thought of Anne and Eugene. But that's when his imagination was overtaken by something much darker, something more sinister. In Trevor's mind, Eugene was now screaming his face bloodied, his hands on his forehead as he began to peel his own skin off. His skin began ripping under his nails, sounding off like tearing flesh as pus and blood spilled from his torn membranes. Trevor opened his eyes in sheer terror. He looked around, half expecting to see the blood-curdling spectacle continue. Mr. Meeks, please. You're attempting to control the narrative to take over the conversation. I simply can't allow that. My diagnostic scan must proceed, Mr. Meeks. The voice continued as it switched from conversation to interrogation. Why can you see my artificial presence on your planet? Is it fear, Mr. Meeks? Fear of being caught? Caught by other men who seem to wish you harm? Mr. Meeks. Trevor thought of the other men the voice spoke of. He thought of Paco, the cages of people he kept. The Chancellor and his town of imprisoned, docile residents. His heart slightly pounded more, mixed with anger and fear. Ah, yes, fear. This was the conclusion with the other assets as well. The others seemingly like yourself, Mr. Meeks. Trevor thought to himself, or to himself, so he thought. Yes, there are more that can see me. So, you can see my dilemma. I feel the labor enlisted on your planet may be too clumsy. They use tactics that are not intelligent. You see, Mr. Meeks, humans will do anything to avoid fear. Why? They could look at a monster straight in the eyes and lose themselves to a place they feel more secure. A place in their minds, you see. They are calm, docile, manageable. But then there are some like you. Those who embrace their fear. Not that you would be able to decide the difference. Your mind is not prepared for that. It is your subconscious, Mr. Meeks. It is what is within you that somehow awakens. Yes, I believe my diagnostics is concluded. For your species, a sense of security is needed. Perhaps a sense of family. A sense of sanctuary. The breeding needs to be patched. An update must be completed. Perhaps an open pasture parameter be put in place. A new open pasture for a more sustainable production line. Thank you, Mr. Meeks. The sounds of whisking winds that seemed to carry the voice to Trevor's ears quickly faded. Hello, Trevor shouted to the empty room. But just like it had arrived, the voice was now no longer. 
Trevor, Trevor, wake up. Trevor slowly came to, hearing the sounds of whispers coming from his sister. Trevor, we gotta move. He opened his eyes and looked around. He tried snapping out of his stupor, trying to shake the feeling of a bad dream. It was one of those dreams which you know was dreadful, yet unable to be recited. When he came to his senses, it was dark outside, very dark, a distant moon, the only light. The rocks and trees over his head only made it darker. They had slept through the day in four-hour shifts, two always keeping guard. They agreed they would continue their tasks at nightfall, regaining the cover of darkness as their only shield. Seth then spoke up. We have to go. Trevor looked over at Seth, who was kneeling next to him. They had found a grassy bank that receded up and under a rocky enclosure. We should be close now. Beck continued the conversation as the three began peering down either ends of the wash. Once we get Anne out of here, we can regroup for more supplies. Then we go get Caleb and Delilah. It should be that much easier with one more person on our side. Trevor and Seth both agreed in a hushed tone. The previous day, they had concluded that Anne was far closer than the kids. It would make much more sense to complete her rescue first, rather than doubling back for her. Trevor, while looking from side to side out of their modestly cramped cave, began to make observations. The wash seems clear. When we make our way up the other side, we'll have to take another look around. The jeep isn't far from there. It got us over the canal. I think it has more than enough gas to get us to the airport. The three ran across the wash and made their way to the other side as they got lower to the ground and began to climb up it on all fours. Once reaching the slight summit, they slowed their pace. They kept a lookout, all eyes darting from side to side. They had parked the jeep in some dense brush across a field at the top. They didn't want it parked too close to them in case it was seen by anyone while they rested. The small field was cluttered with young natural growth and surrounded by larger growth on all sides of it. The meager sized moon that night gave off just enough light to gather the sights of the field and surrounding narrow forestry. It bled out into the darkened void of the abandoned cityscape beyond it. There, Beck pointed, the three could see a taillight peering out of the bush. They all began racing toward the vehicle, crossing through the partly open pasture, eyes open for any incoming issues. Beck was now in the driver's seat, and then, starting up the engine, they made their way through the field, dodging around the sporadic plant life. As they traveled the fields, Seth pulled a map from the glove compartment in front of him, left there previously. Compliments of Kent and his two lapdogs. It's maybe three miles tops. They were driving slowly as to keep an eye out ahead for any upcoming threats. They kept the headlights off to maintain stealth as they traversed the muddy patches, making their way to the darkened eastern district of Esmeraldas. They stuck to the back roads and alleyways as they made their journey across the fragile cityscape. Unable to make out most of the street signs while driving, they had to often stop to gain their bearings. Eventually, they came up to a sign that read E15. An old stretch of highway that now separated them from vacant dark fields with the silhouettes of a jungle landscape off in the distance. There it is, Beck announced as she stopped and killed the engine. We walk from here, shouldn't be far. They had agreed earlier not to come too close to the airport with a running engine announcing their arrival. The three grabbed their weapons. This time, they were each armed with assault rifles and flashlights, thanks to a more thorough search of the vehicle the previous night. Once placing the flashlights in their pockets, they swung the rifle straps to their shoulders. They ran across a small field that separated the on-ramp they were once on to a small gas station parking lot. It was dark and eerily silent as they dashed across the vacant lot. A slight ring resonated close by 
emanating from an old, rusty wind chime hanging from a tattered awning attached to the station's small store. There were four old-style, run-down gas pumps directly in their path, a medium-sized canopy sheltering them. The three huddled behind one of the pumps, trying to view the scenery across the highway and spot anything resembling an airport. It was extremely dark out, with not much of a moon in the midnight sky to light the terrain ahead. Seth was the first to break the group's silence. There. He pointed to a dark void, ever so slightly cropping out of the distant, shadowy horizon. As their eyes adjusted, they could make out what looked like a tower next to a larger structure, perhaps a terminal or a hangar. Let's go, Beck ordered, as she was the first one to begin running along the chipped and cracked asphalt. They made their way to the end of the parking lot. There was no sign of where it ended, as the overgrown vegetation had begun to adopt the pavement as its home over the years, blurring any borders they once had with each other. The grassy field they came up to slowly rose to the multi-lane freeway, where they could finally see, just to the other side, a large fence topped with barbed wire. Just on the other side of the road, parked on the shoulder facing west, sat an old, rusted-out car. As if their minds were linked, they each ran to it, racing to a huddled position next to the deserted vehicle opposite the airfield. I don't see anyone. Looks good to me, Trevor stated while looking to his team for affirmation. They both looked at him in agreement and rose to their feet. The three began trekking across the latest muddy ground, the last they would encounter before reaching their objective. They each placed their gun straps over their shoulders and swung them to their backs as they began negotiating the vertical chain link obstacle. Side by side, they reached the top, carefully maneuvering the weathered, worn down barbed wire. And one by one, they dropped to the other side. They ran up to the base of a watchtower, not too far off from the fence, hoping that no one was using it for all its potential. They stayed a minute with a calm manner to listen for any signs of anyone alerted or close by. The three studied each other's faces. No one said it, but they were all thinking it. This is too easy. So far, they hadn't run into any guards. No Russians, no cartel, nothing. If this were anything like what they saw on the other side of the canal, wouldn't there be armed men at the watch? Could Kent have been lying? Could this place be a dead end? Then suddenly, they all flinched at the same time, hunching down in a manner of physical preservation. There was a loud sound that came from the terminal across the tarmac. Trevor immediately identified the sound, but he wasn't the only one who had recognized it, just the first to label it. Generator, they looked around the corner of the tower at the terminal. They knew the sound they heard was a generator but they saw no lights coming from within the building. He continued, I don't see jack shit. Not a single Russian or anything. Seth agreed with a few remarks of his own on the topic. Let's not look a gift horse in its mouth. We heard a generator for sure. There's at least something going on in there. I say we just start crossing. Guns aimed in all directions. He finished his remarks awaiting their answers. I'm in, Beck announced. Me too, her younger brother echoed. Seth, happy they were on board, continued leading the small portion of their mission. Okay then, let's go. They proceeded across the grass, soon encountering the hard pavement of the runway. Seth led the way, and Beck and Trevor walked behind, marching backward, training their weapons upon the open spaces closing in around them. Eventually, and surprisingly, without incident, they each arrived at the terminal's exterior walls. They began scoping the wall for an opening as they felt their way along the outside of the vast building. Trevor was now leading them as the other two peered into the open lot, staying alert, maintaining the safety of the operation. A noticeable difference in the generator's level of sound had the three on edge, as they assumed they were closing in on whoever or whatever was operating it. Trevor's hand 
sliding along the black and dark wall, felt something cross its touch. Got it. The other two looked over at him and then at the wall, their eyes adjusting to the blurry void. They ultimately saw a door come into focus. The three looked at each other. Trevor nodded, followed by a nod from Beck and Seth. With his cohorts on board, he slowly began to pull the steel handle down. As he rotated it, they heard the clicks of the inner workings of the handle sound off. After what felt like forever, the handle was all the way down, the door ready to be open, the three looking at each other, not knowing what to expect inside. Trevor stood back and slowly opened the door, swinging it toward them while Beck and Seth aimed inside. A thick, icy air crept out of the growing opening and enveloped the three. They slowly proceeded into the unknown darkness that lay before them. First Seth, Beck, and then Trevor, softly closing the weighted door behind him, avoiding a slamming sound it would have made on its own. Whatever the generator was powering, it wasn't lights, as the room was nearly pitch black, with just a tiny glow let in by the high windows from the little light the partial moon was giving off. The chilly interior was a first big clue as to what the generator was for. The three of them noticed their visible breaths, exhaled from their lungs, hanging in the motionless, frigid air. As their eyes adjusted, and the generator became much louder now that they were inside, objects all around them came into view. They all took out their flashlights and pointed them up where the still objects could be seen. The interior was not that big, nor did they expect it to be as the airport only comprised of one runway outside. The ceilings were maybe 20 feet high, with hooks systematically placed along its surface. Each hook had a cable attached to it, suspending large see-through plastic-like objects slightly above them. As their flashlights lowered to illuminate the mysterious objects, chills ran down their spines. Within each large plastic wrap, dangled a lifeless human body. Each one was equally plump as the next, onset with bruising of the skin ushered in by post-mortem. The plastic was tightly fixed around each corpse, as if to be vacuum sealed. They each had their mouths stitched closed and tubes protruding from their abdomens. It was an all too familiar sight for the three who were brought to utter stillness battered by the ghostly silence that swept through the vast tomb. Upon further undesired observation, they noticed a chilling difference with these bodies. Aside from them all maintaining an unsettling similar plumpness, they all had thick metallic bolts jutting from a swell on their foreheads. It was a telling sign of the demise of the cadaverous assembly. Seth was the first to lose it. I'm gonna be sick. With that, he promptly doubled over and lost what little he had in his stomach over the cement flooring below him. The two beside him, still gawking at the horrendous displays around them, held their flashlights to the air. The team soon lost all ability to maintain an acute lookout of their surroundings, stunned and overwhelmed with their latest frightening encounter. Trevor was the first to snap out of it. This deer in headlights posture the three were currently exhibiting left them open and vulnerable. Over there, he squeaked in a sickly manner, trying hard not to join his friend in losing his stomach to the cold cement. The other two, still shuddering with terror, looked to where Trevor was pointing. It was an elevator, but most importantly, it was an elevator with a lit up control panel, signifying that it had power. Fuck that. I'm done with elevators, Seth answered, reminding his friends of their last experience with such a compartment. Trevor looked over, almost siding with Seth, then looked at Beck, who gave him a useless shrug of the shoulder. Trevor tried to press his weak stomached friend. We have to, Seth. Anne could be down there. Seth looked at the two who were awaiting him to come to the only conclusion they would accept then lowered his head and used a hand to forcefully wipe his eyes, shaking off his nausea. He then composed himself the best he could, attempting to show as much confidence he could muster. 
and whispered, Okay, let's go. The three proceeded along the floor that lay before them, trying hard not to look at the hair-raising objects around them, with Beck leading the group. They used their flashlights, dodging the body bags with their rays of light, surveying the lifeless room, ensuring they were the only living ones in the icy gravesite. Then Beck broke the whisper tone they had so carefully kept. She didn't mean to. She knew how to be just as stealthy as anyone else. But the sight of what her flashlight now rested on changed the entire course of their mission. Oh my god. No. Trevor and Seth ran up to her on either side as she fell to her knees, her flashlight rolling away into the darkness, projecting a jarring display of lights and shadows around them. They came to their knees and embraced her, hoping she hadn't been hurt. No, she cried again. The two while holding her, looked over her head at each other in confusion. She wasn't hurt. Was it something she saw? They both shined their lights ahead of them, then slowly up. They could not yet make sense of her distress, and she was too distraught to console or question, so they proceeded to take in any clue of what may have alarmed her. Their flashlights wandered slowly side to side, and mostly upward along a naked and bruised, plump body. Tubes extended from the abdomen just like the rest. Mouth stitched closed, also just like the rest. And then they noticed what had her so upset. As their lights joined together, they illuminated a familiar sight. A face of someone they knew. It was Anne. A thick metallic bolt extended from within her brow.